Now we look at treasures from Juniper Ridge text and we have two chapters today to look at and the first one of those is Descending with the View from Above and beginning on page 27 if you're following along. And again in this text we have Yeshit Sogal asking questions, Pama Sambhava then responding and I will just give some of the highlights of those. So First, she asks the Master, from where do all that appears and exists, the phenomena of samsara and nirvana, first arise? And so he replies with labeling. So we've talked about this before. As we begin to label things, then we begin to think about things differently. We solidify it based on those labels and so forth, and that begins to generate all sorts of issues that we have resulting in our various forms of suffering. So then she asks, how does one become free from attaching labels? And he replies that we are free from the thought activity of mental labeling. When we're free from that. Uh, so we're free from that. We also be free from attaching names to things. So these names are not real. Uh, so we would be better to be free from labeling. So he didn't give a very specific uh, explanation of how to be free from labeling, which was the question, but rather than we just need to let go of and be free from that. So she asks, what is the way to be free from labeling? And he replies, let them naturally dissolve. So just let them be in their natural state, in the same way that we do regular shamatha practice and thoughts come up, we just let them go. So then she asks, what is the meeting point beyond both Buddhas and sentient beings? And he replies, the natural state. Okay, the natural state is rikpa. So it's beyond knowing and unknowing and so forth. She asks, how are sentient beings then deluded into this labeling? And he replies, ego arises. So out of this, the ego comes and solidifies and those names become solidified and we conceptualize them even further and so forth. We work ourselves into these very fixed views of things. So then she asks, how does one then attain enlightenment? And he replies, and in this case, there's a number of pieces here. Dharma beyond fabrication, Dharma beyond indication, Dharma beyond explanation, Dharma beyond cultivation. Don't do anything, don't go anywhere, don't think, don't construct, don't judge, don't focus, don't support, don't take aim, don't cling. Simply remain. So Dharmakaya is beyond thought, word, and description. So again, it's resting in that natural state. Then she asks, isn't this the nature of non-action? To which he replies, remain free from mental constructs. Again, she, he doesn't give a real direct answer to the question there. And so she asks, is mind, for, mind the basis for faults? And he replies, the lack of realization is the basis for faults. So realize the nature of mind to be empty in essence within this vast and empty dharmakaya. No defilement of faults can live. And then she asks, are objects and mind a duality? And he replies, objects and mind are not two. And then she asks, should Buddhahood be achieved in some other place? To which he responds, from the state of non-arising, their play appeared as the threefold kayas. So it's not actually some other place, but the appearance of the kayas per se. And then she asked, what is the confidence free from the dread of change and transmigration? When you have perfected the power of self-knowing and great equality, there is fundamentally no change or transmigration. Then she asks, where do we find an abode that is fearless in the face of death? And he replied, when you realize the nature of your mind never arises. It's just there, it's always been there. 
She asks, can this nature of mind be tainted by karma and habitual tendencies? And he replies, this mind never arises. It is empty, insubstantial, and wide open, beyond being tainted by any virtuous or unvirtuous karma. And then she asks, does there exist any abyss into which one might fall? And the master replied, the mind is Dharmakaya's vastness. The worlds of the six beings are but Buddha fields. So it's a different view that we take regarding these things. And she asked, can the view possibly fall into partiality? He replied, it is free from partiality just like the sky. She asked, can that which be, we cultivate and meditation really be obscured or clarified? And he replied, let it be as changeless dharmata within an empty essence of your mind. It is beyond being obscured. Lady Tsogal asks, is there anything in the conduct to adopt or avoid? And he replied, the conduct free from anything to adopt and to avoid is like a flawless crystal ball, empty, lucid mind itself, which is not made of faults or qualities. She asked, does the fruition exist to be accomplished from somewhere else? And he replied, it cannot be achieved. It is the self-present Dharmakaya. So it's not something you can do, it's something that's already existent. Then she asked, should we regard outer appearances as imperfect? And he replied, do not find faults in outer things. They are seen, but not really there. Then she asked, should we regard our thoughts as imperfect? And he replied, don't see thoughts as being faulty. It is but the dharmas, dharmatas display. Then she asked, should we depend upon conditioned roots of virtue? And he replied, dharmata is self-present timelessly. And she asked, can original wakefulness manifest or vanish the coming and going of things? And he replied, the wakeful knowing appearing in yourself is itself lucid since the very beginning. No coming and going. She asked, can cause and result be divided into two? And he said, there is no division. She asked, should love and hate be rejected? And he replied, the five poisons are not to be rejected, nor is wakefulness a thing to be object, re, achieved. They are, five emotions are self-dissolving, so they come and they go, just like a thought that we might have. The afflictive emotions uh, happen in the same way. She asked, are samsara and nirvana respectfully evil and good? And he replies that they are beyond evil and beyond good. Now keep in mind, this is the ultimate view here of things. And then she asked, how are the three kayas present within oneself? And he replied, the empty nature of mind is dharmakaya. It is cognizance, is sambhokakaya, and its unconfined quality is nirmanakaya. And these three kayas are primordially present within you. She asked, can the nature of dharmata be applied in practice? And he responded that you see that the Buddhahood is not a place which you must reach. So there's no application. There's nothing that we have to specifically do as a part of that. Then she asked, can we possibly fall into samsara? And he replies that the timeless purity is undiluted wakefulness, which cannot fall. So we cannot fall into samsara when we reach this level. She asked, is there a doer of dharma practice? And he replied that the doer of the tenfold virtuous action is primordially an emptiness. There is no doer. 
So she asked, should we rely on personal instructions? And he replied, Buddha mind is your own nature. Simply knowing is the Dharmakaya. You cannot be shown, it cannot be shown to you by someone else. So then she asked, do realized practitioners still have to take rebirth? And he replied, fairly long, but at the bottom, there is no basis for another karmic birth. The master then said, this instruction is the path traversed by the Buddhas of the three times. Since they all awakened within this nature, it is the path through which the beings of the three realms are liberated. Since they are freed within this nature, it is the realization of me, Padma. So, so gal, keep it in your heart. Okay? It will be a mirror for those with right karmic fortune. So that concludes that particular chapter.